All right, so this, vid this video is in front of a live student audience, I'll have you know, um, of six of my AP th APC physics students. Uh, and in this video, we're going to just talk about time constant and what the time constant is and why it's really useful for functions that have some kind of exponential behavior. Okay. So, so the other day, we learned about uh, the terminal velocity. And we went through a lot of trouble and we derived a function for the velocity of an object that falls through air. And this was the, the result that we got. Okay, and uh, so we, we have this type of a thing for the velocity. Now, we also took the derivative of that, which was not that big of a deal, and we got the result that the, the derivative of the velocity gives us acceleration. That's equal to g times e with the same exponent in it. So it's a negative exponent. Uh, it's equal to negative k over m times t. k is a constant, right? K that comes from the drag formula. So this goes along with our drag force. Okay, so k is just some kind of a constant, which tells us how strong air resistance is. And m is the mass of the object. And t is time. Okay, well, something I'd like to point out is that... Um, if you were to take the exponent argument and rearrange it, like if you, instead of writing e to the negative k over m times t, I'm just going to write e to the negative t divided by m over k. Aha! Tricky, right? So I, I basically took you know, k over m, and, and I want to put it in the denominator, so I have to flip it so that it's now m over k. You might wonder, well, why why would you do that? You know, what's the purpose of doing that? Well, if you look at this now, you know, what you can actually tell me what the units of mass divided by k have to be in order for me to get an answer to this, to evaluate this this exponential, to raise e to something you can tell me what the units have to be because there's a rule in math that you can't you can't have any units in the, in the argument the overall argument up here t divided by m over k can't have any units it must be unitless all right that whole thing must be unitless must be all right you can't have units left over and evaluate something in the exponent so that tells us that m over k must have what units. They must be in seconds. Yeah, they must have units of time. So that means that m over k must have units in seconds, I guess, or just generally in time. Right? Because t is in seconds, so you've got to divide by seconds to cancel them out. So that kind of suggests that something interesting here, that m over k might have some significance in terms of time. And it does. Um, we are going to, to say, we're going to introduce something new called uh, a time constant. And the symbol is a tau. So tau is equal to a time constant. And um, for the problem that we're talking about right now, that's going to be equal to the mass of the falling object divided by the k value. Okay, so... That's what it is. Now, we don't really know exactly what it is yet, but it's got to have, m over k must have the dimensions of time, and we're going to call it a time constant. Now, let's back up, and let's just talk math for a second here, and, and, and I want to convince you that time constant actually is, is kind of an interesting thing, a useful thing. Um, I'm going to make a simple table where I put um, t on the one side, and then on the other side, I'm going to put e raised to the negative t over tau. Okay. 
So again, tau is a time constant. It's something in seconds. Let's just think about it like that for now. And here's what I'm going to, we're going to do is just to see well what happens to my what happens to this function as the time increases. So if I were to make a graph of e raised to the negative t over tau, what would that graph look like when the time is equal to zero? What would it look like when the time is equal to exactly one time constant, one tau? What would it look like when the time is equal to two time constants, etc.? You get the idea? So tau is actually like might be a, a specific number. So what, what's going to happen to this? Uh, it's going to be getting closer to zero, right? So if this is a, if this is like a well-behaved exponential function that's negative, it's going to start at some value here, and it's going to drop its way down to zero. In fact, we could probably even sketch it right now because we could, we sort of know it's got to look like that. Okay. So let's see where the, this thing falls at these different times. So we're going to have a time equal to zero, one tau. 2 tau, 3 tau, etc. Right? We'll stop at 3. Now, for the first one, we don't need a calculator at all, right? What if you um, what if you substitute in 0 for t? Little t, right? What does that expression become? e to the 0. What's that equal to? 1. And so that puts our scale here. This is 1. That's our starting point. Cool. Let's do the next one. Let's make this time now equal to 1 tau. So this is now going to become e to the negative 1 tau over tau. What's that equal to? Yeah, that's e to the negative 1 which is the same thing as 1 over e. And at this point, we do have to break out calculators here. But let's wait for a second before we, let's wait before we do it. Let's do, let's do the next few, and then I'll have, I'll have people calculate these. Let's do the next one. What would the next one be? All right, you'd have negative 2 times tau divided by tau. That's e to the negative 2. 1 over e squared. I'm catching on the pattern here. The next one, I'm just going to put dot, dot, dot. It's going to be equal to 1 over e cubed. OK. Now, at this point, I need calculator help. Can we get decimals for these things? Because we're going to think about this in terms of what percentage has the function decayed. So I guess on a calculator, locate the E button, and then raise it to the negative 1, raise it to the negative 2, etc. So can I get some help? What's E to the negative 1? Point, give, it to me, give, me the, give me the first two digits. Round it to two digits for me. 0.37. Awesome. What's E to the negative 2? So what we're let's just check something right here. So what we see here is that um, it's this is if you think about this in terms of percentages, right? When you're at one, one is one point zero. That's a that's basically right here. That's like a hundred percent. Now when you get to one tau, when you let one time constant go by. 
my, my picture here is not really very accurate the way I drew it. Sorry, but um, you've actually dropped. A, you've dropped to a certain percentage. You are now at 37%. So if this is one up here, you're now at 37%. You see, my I should have made this drop a little more steeply, but I didn't. But it does. Uh, when you get to two tau, you're now down to 14%. Right, 14% of what? Of what you started with, right? Of one. Um, and this just keeps on going. At three tau, you're down to uh, down to five percent, etc. So what this means is that if you wait around, you know, if you waited around for three time constants, if you let three time constants tick by on a clock, basically you will have decayed all the way down to only five percent. Of what you started with. In other words, you would have done 95% of your decaying <laughs> in this function in between 0 and 3 tau because you know that you're ending at only 5% left. And that is true for any exponential decay. For any function you can think of, if you define the time constant this way, when three of those time constants go by, you are down to 5% of your, you know, of whatever you started with. Thing, which is um, generally true. So when we talk about, say, for example, um, physics here, and we say, well, what if what if you have acceleration, and acceleration is equal to g times e to the negative t over tau? You know, first of all, what is uh, what does tau mean? Well, tau course is going to mean it's mass over k. We won't worry about that right now, but that's, that's physically what it is. Um, but let me ask you this. Let me say um, when will the acceleration be equal to 50% of g, right? When will you be at, you know, 4.9 meters per second squared? In terms of time constants, when will that be? So in other words, t is going to be equal to blank, right? How many time constants? All right, so I'll give you a second here to see if you can figure that out. So how many time constants have to go by? You could look at my graph here, and maybe you can estimate it, right? It's got to be in between 0 and 1. It's got to be someplace in here, because we went from 100% to 37% in that first time constant. So if I'm just saying getting to 50%, I've got to be someplace in here. Now, can you do, do better than that and tell me exactly where? So, so at 50%, it's zero. All right, so maybe 0.7. Let's see. We'll see if you're right. So for acceleration, we'll have 0.5 times g. That's 50% of g on the left side of the equation. That's equal to g times e to negative t over tau. You guys with me on this? So the 50%, I'm writing it down right here. That's my 0.5 g. And I want to figure out, I want to solve for t. I'll circle that. Divide chip G by both sides. Okay, now what do I do? Natural log. Uh, I'm worried though, because I'm thinking the natural log of something less than one is going to be negative. Right, you have a negative that's over here. Remember, you're trying to solve for T, and that negative should be should cancel out. So we shouldn't get a negative answer here at the end of the day. So you should end up with negative tau times natural log 0.5 is equal to the time. And what does that give us? 0 0.69. Right. So, so that, that's how much of a time constant has to 
how much time has to go by in order for you to be at half of your original value of something. Yeah, so that that's the that is the deal with this. Um, now I'm not just to, to mention this without going into a lot more detail. What about the other function? What about the what about functions like this where you have one minus e to the negative t over tau? Right? What if that's your function? Um, and what does time constant mean there? So let's try that. Let's make a little table where we have t and one minus. And we'll do zero, one, two, three. Um, I think we've already kind of done the hard work on this, right, in terms of the math. Because now I'm just basically doing one minus my other table values. So one minus, what is this? One minus, well, e to the zero is one. So this is 1 minus 1. And then we have what? 1 minus 0.37. And then 1 minus 0.14. Yeah. So you're getting 0, um, 0 0.63. Point eight six and point nine five, etc. Um, this, by the way, matches up with the graph that has a different shape now. So now this is my one minus e to t over tau, or this is t. Let me try to be a little bit more accurate in my putting the points on this one. Um, clearly, at, at the time is equal to zero nothing has had a chance to build up yet. So if this is an object that you're dropping out of, out of a window, um, its velocity is zero when you first let it go. Okay, so that, that's the zero here. But if you wait for one time constant to go by, now this thing is gonna go up to 63% of its maximum value. So this is at one tau, and now I'm at 63%. When I wait another tau, so I go up to two tau, I'm now 86% of the way there. 86%, right? And when I say the way there, I mean to the asymptote, right? To that, to that, that, that first dash sign that we drew. And for terminal velocity problems, that is the terminal velocity, right? So when you're at two tau, you're 86% of the way to your terminal velocity. Um, of course, when you get to three tau, you're up to 95%. I don't think I'm going to squeeze that in the picture, but you know, in, theoretically, you keep getting closer and closer. You never get there. It's an asymptote, but that's uh, the way. What that you know that works. So to kind of summarize here, if you have a decaying function, that was the first thing we did. When you are at one tau, that means you were down to 37%, the 37% level. When you have a function which is rising to meet an asymptote, in other words, one minus that exponential, then when you're at one tau, you've risen to 63% of your, you know, your final, um, Velocity, I guess, your terminal velocity. So I know in math class that, you know, 1 over e gives you 37%. 1 minus 1 over e gives you 63%. Those are actually kind of significant numbers in math because exponential curves show up in so many different places. So um, in our case, in physics, this is going to be acceleration for the top curve, velocity for the bottom curve. And um, so that's kind of the background. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, there are some problems in the homework, 3, 4, and 5, that you can look at, and you have to kind of figure out how to use this to, to solve those. So um, 
I think at this point I'm going to stop and uh, we'll let you guys try those out. So.